heart disease led to one in every three deaths in America. That is a lot of morbidity and mortality. That is causing a lot of problems. All right, welcome back everybody to episode two of our second season of the Building Lifelong Athletes podcast. And today we're gonna to talk about atherosclerosis. We're gonna talk all about what actually atherosclerosis is, what causes it, and you know, kind of the nitty gritty behind it. Because once again, it's super important to understand where we come from here. But we're gonna dive into this lesson right now. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, welcome back everybody to lesson number two here. We're talking about atherosclerosis today. So once again, kind of a headier subject, atherosclerosis, maybe not as exciting. Like what does this have to do with lifelong athletes? But we'll kind of talk about why it's so important, but it is really, really critically important just to be an overall healthy person to talk about this and understand this. This will base off of what we talked about last time. So if you haven't watched, you know, in the first episode about lipid metabolism, I think it'll be helpful to understand this a little bit, but it can stand on its own if you need to. Um, we're gonna talk about this and what really causes atherosclerosis. You know, there's a lot of people talking on the internet saying it's this, it's that. We're gonna break down like what the actual science says. So we're gonna dive into it right now. Okay, so moving on to the introduction here, like I wanna talk about the why behind atherosclerosis. You know, we hear lots of talk about atherosclerosis, but for me, when we understand the why behind something, then that helps me understand it first and foremost. And then once we understand it, it helps me, you know, treat it better. So if we don't understand the why behind something, then we're not gonna know why we're doing what we're doing, right? If you don't know why you're doing something, then you can't make a plan and learn how to go out and attack it. So for me, understanding why is critically important. Um, once we know it, then we can treat it. So for me, I could take a step back. It can be a little nerdy. It can be a little boring sometimes to like really dig into the science to understand what's going on, but I think it overall is very, very helpful. So, and also this is so important because it's such a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States. So this is super, super prevalent. Uh, if you don't have it, you, I guarantee you know someone who does. And so we care about it because it's everywhere. And also we care about this because it can happen all over the body, right? So if it happens in our coronary arteries, right by the heart, that's, you know, coronary heart disease. If it happens in our legs, it's peripheral artery disease. And so lots of different places it can happen. It can happen over in the aorta, your renal arteries, maybe the cerebral arteries, all these different places it can happen. And so it's not just one specific spot. But we're going to talk about it because it's, it's super, super common and we see it all the time. But I want to you know, have you understand this and feel a little bit better about it so you can feel confident going forward, understanding how to, how to treat it and how to make a plan. All right, let's move on to some statistics here. Um, this is just kind of helping you get a baseline understanding of how big of a problem this is. In the United States, it's estimated that the lifetime risk of total cardiovascular disease is somewhere greater than 50%. So you have a greater than 50% chance of having some sort of cardiovascular disease. What does that entail? Well, things like fatal and non-fatal MI. MI is myocardial infarction or heart attack. So, you know, that's heart attacks included, strokes, and also heart failure. So you have a more than 50% chance of developing one of those things, heart attack, stroke, heart failure in your lifetime because of cardiovascular disease. That's really important. On top of that, there are about 121 million Americans who had some sort of CVD between 2013 and 2015, and about 700,000 suffer new or recurrent stroke annually. I mean, that's a lot of morbidity and mortality. You know, if you don't care about that necessarily, let's talk about the cost. You know, it was estimated that about 14% of healthcare related expenses are spent on atherosclerosis for something like $351 billion. So something insanely huge. You know, it's projected to be about $749 billion by 2035. So obviously that shows the trajectory of where we're going, that it's not getting better. But it costs a lot of money to take care of this because this can lead to some really long standing problems and, and some really expensive problems too. And on top of that, you might say, whatever, if I have some heart disease, cost me, you know, whatever, I don't care, well, what should I care about? Well, you should care about death. This is the leading cause of death among adults, you know, in 2016 when the study that I saw, you know, it accounted for one in three deaths in adults. So let me say that again. Heart disease led to one in every three deaths in America. That is a lot of morbidity and mortality. That is causing a lot of problems, you know, and it's also the leading cause of death worldwide. There's about 17.6 million deaths in 2016. So just to kind of break it down here. This is a pervasive problem. This is everywhere and it affects almost every single person. You know, obviously more than 50% of people are having this. It's costing us billions upon billions of dollars every year. And it's one of the most likely reasons why you would die. So this is why we care so much about this so we can understand it, treat it and prevent that from happening. All right, so let's break down into our overview here. Just, just the general overview of atherosclerosis. So it is complex. It's complex and it begins at a very early age. You know, there's some data, unfortunately, showing on autopsies that fatty streaks can be seen in children and sometimes adolescents. We'll talk what fatty streaks are, but long story short, it's the starting of atherosclerosis and can be seen in children and sometimes adolescents. However, usually it's silent until the sixth or seventh decade. So obviously, usually you live with this. It takes years and years and years and years to get there, but it doesn't really start showing itself with any problems until the fifth, sixth, seventh decade of life. And so that's why people think this is an old person problem. Not really. This accumulates over time and it takes 20, 30, 40 years till it actually kind of becomes a problem. 
you know, once established though, it's usually going to progress. There are many, many things that make atherosclerosis progress. Some things like age, you know, just the more birthdays you collect, the more likely you're going to have atherosclerosis. That's just how it works. Like I said, it's that accumulation over time that we care about high cholesterol or dyslipidemia is another reason. If you have uncontrolled hypertension, maybe increased sympathetic tone, which is kind of our, you know, fight or flight nervous system. If you smoke, if you have obesity, if you have a sedentary lifestyle, chronic kidney disease, just general inflammation can do it. Uh, there are some studies that maybe depression can, can lead to increased risk as well, but also things like insulin resistance, diabetes, live in urban areas with lots of pollution. There's tons and tons of things that can lead to progression of it. And so it's really important to understand what these risk factors are so we can kind of go out there and attack it. So just taking a step back, 30,000 foot overview, this is a lifelong disease. So this is not a disease of the elderly person. This starts when you are young or in your adolescence and it builds over life. And that's why we care so much about understanding what these risk factors are and how we can attack those because the earlier we can attack those the earlier we can cut this off right and that's what it's all about in this game when we're playing a preventative medicine type game we want to prevent it as early as we as we can so we want to intervene as early as we can so that we can prevent it from progressing later and so that's what i'm really really passionate about all right so you might be like well jordan that's a super bummer uh, i'm not looking forward to that what can i do well there is some good news that we can potentially slow this down or reverse it so there are a couple different things um, that have been shown to either slow the progression or maybe potentially reverse it it depends on, you know, how intensive things are, you know, statins are medications that we do have. Um, and they have been shown time and time again to improve atherosclerotic outcomes. Um, it can usually, you know, slow down progression. They improve endothelial function. So we'll talk more about the endothelium, but that's the lining of our, our blood vessels. It reduces inflammation. It stabilizes those plaques we talked about and it does, it just reduces the risk of MI or stroke. And so like they are fantastic medications. I know the internet is full of crazy things and every medication has its own risk factors. Let's recognize that, but they are truly life-saving medications and they really, really help, you know, other things that can help maybe slow down or maybe even reverse is if you reverse your risk factors, right? So if you reverse your cholesterol, your blood pressure, you lose a lot of weight, you stop smoking, pretty much if you just stop doing all those things that can help to, you know, halting the progression or potentially reversing it, depending on you know, how intense that is. And so when people say, is it possible to reverse heart disease? There's some studies that show it might be possible. It's definitely not a slam dunk, but you can definitely like halt or slow the progression by making drastic lifestyle changes or adding medications on top of that as well. However, as Americans, like most things, our prevention of that is terrible. So usually we are dealing with the consequences of it later after we've had clinically significant atherosclerotic disease, whether that's a you know a stroke or heart attack, usually we're dealing with it later. So like I said, my goal here is to try to deal with it beforehand so we prevent from ever getting to that problem to begin with. And instructions, well, we talked about in lipids, right? We talked about ApoB. If you haven't watched that, go back, watch it. But any ApoB particle can essentially get into the endothelium and cause this, um, as long as it's under 70 nanometers in size. So that's you know obviously not very big, but almost all of our particles can get in there except for like the biggest VLDLs and the chylomicrons. So VLDLs are typically like 30 to 80 nanometers. So, you know, some of the VLDLs can definitely do it, but like the biggest, biggest ones can't. And then chylomicrons are usually like 75 to 600 nanometers. So like they usually can't fit in, but once again, VLDL, IDL, LDL, those can all fit in there. And I know people will talk, you know, that's a probably another talk. They'll talk about all that matters is the size. If you have big fluffy ones, well, guess what? Your big fluffy LDLs are not as big as your, your VLDLs and they can still fit in your artery wall and cause atherosclerosis. So, um, just wanted to throw that out there that, you know, most of those things can get in there. And so, uh, that is a big risk factor. All right, next we're gonna move on to the arterial structure. So if you are following along on our video podcast here, you're gonna see that we have two different views here. We have a view on the left that looks like the um, artery is coming straight out at you. And then on the right, we have like a side view. Um, they're both kind of indicating the same thing with different views with my amazing artwork. And there are three layers of the arterial wall, the intima, media, and adventitia. So the intima, this is essentially the innermost part. This is you know where we find those endothelial cells, right? There's an endothelial cell monolayer. So, you know, a one cell thick that interfaces with the blood. So this is the one that's coming in direct contact with the blood. We also have inside the intima, something called the lamina propria, uh, which consists of smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, collagen, intercellular matrix, all these fun things that have other things like hyaluronic and heparin sulfate. So we'll kind of talk about all these things, but it's just a very complicated uh, milieu of things that are inside there. But so that is the intima, right? Kind of the endothelial cells that really want to take home there. Then we have the media. Media is made of smooth muscle cells, which they essentially regulate arterial tone and blood pressure through contracting or relaxing, um, you know, depending on which substances are released. You know, they respond to things like nitric oxide, catecholamines, which are like, you know, adrenaline things, angiotensin II, which is, you know, what has to do with blood pressure. So lots of different things can affect it. And the media though is typically separated from the intima and the adventitia. So kind of it's on its own. It's, it's separated by elastic membranes, um, but 
the problem is with anatherosclerosis, a lot of times, you know, smooth muscle cells from the media can then migrate into the intima and get incorporated into plaques, which is not good. And so usually we have this nice delineation, but that can be an issue with atherosclerosis later. And the final layer, the outermost layer is the adventitia. This has fibroblasts, elastin, collagen, you know, lots of collagen, obviously, in, in anything that's, you know, has um, elastic properties here. And it also hosts the parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves. So the adventitia is where our nerve supply is. Um, and the big thing, this, everything works together, right? It's, you know, dynamically changing and it's very responsive to the environment. So if you think about it, if nitric oxide gets released, something's going to happen. You know, we're going to have vasodilation. If we have adrenaline, we're going to have, you know, vasoconstriction. So it's kind of going back and forth, back and forth, responding to the thing. It's like this beautiful dance and it has to be able to respond to the stimulus that your body's giving it. You know, if we want it to relax, we want it to relax. If we need to clamp down, we need to do that. And being responsive and flexible is, is a sign of a healthy, you know, artery. And on top of that, I do want to mention that we do have something called gap junction. So essentially the cells connect to each other and they have these things called gap junctions. Um, this is, you know, essentially the connections of the cells. It's, it helps facilitate communication. Um, and this is where it helps also keep things out. So when we have the gap junctions, it essentially as proves, provides us a little bit of a barrier as well. And so we can kind of keep things out, but also help with communication. And so just stepping back here. 30,000 foot view. We have the intima media adventitia inside the intima. Those are endothelial cells. The media is essentially, you know, our, our smooth muscle for contraction and then adventitia outside has some support stuff, but also has our nerve supply. Um, and then these gap junctions kind of help keep things in place where they should be in terms of they help regulate things that can't get in and out and also provide communication as well. All right, once again, we're going to continue with my fantastic drawings. This is that side view of the artery that we just talked about. So once we have, again, they have the intima, media, and adventitia, and it's just showing what a normal or healthy endothelial endothelial cell looks like you know normally when it's healthy we have no real problems here the tone is well controlled like i said we have good balance with everything you know there are antithrombotic properties in there so lots of different things when it's healthy the endothelial cells line the lumen and they control once again what gets in and what gets out so it's kind of like that barrier saying hey you know oh i don't like that thing i'm gonna keep it out Usually when it's healthy too, nitric oxide is produced, you know, usually by the endothelial nitric oxide synthase. And then this process is activated by other things called like bradykinin, acetylcholine, substance peen, all these things that can act on it. But all, all I want you to get from this is that nitric oxide essentially then moves down the gradient and it activates cyclic GMP and then causes smooth muscle relaxation. It also does other things as well. We'll talk about like inhibits platelet aggregation, but nitric oxide is super important. And we need like having that normal response to nitric oxide indicates a healthy endothelial Cell. And we'll see later when we have dysfunctional endothelial cells that we don't quite have that normal reaction nitric oxide. And so on top of that, I mentioned antithrombotic properties. That just means it's, you know, it helps not get clots. And normally the endothelium has these properties, including having tissue plasminogen activator or TPA, which is actually like the stuff we give when people are having strokes. So it helps, you know, make sure that we don't have clots. It also cuts up fibrin. And then also we have heparin sulfate, which stops thrombin, which is a clotting um, molecule as well. And it also inhibits, like I said, the nitric oxide inhibits platelet aggregation. So we have all these factors working together with TPA and with nitric oxide trying to help us have not have clots on the endothelium, right? So a normal, healthy endothelium does not have just clotting everywhere. We have mechanisms to kind of, you know, prevent that. And so what happens though, when it becomes abnormal? Well, like I said, how does it become a normal is the first question. It can become abnormal through multiple different exposures. You know, a couple of things are, if it gets exposed to atherogenic lipoproteins, like we talked about, like the ApoB containing compounds, if you have elevated blood pressure, you smoke, Maybe there's different inflammatory molecules, though, free radicals, elevated glucose, shear stress on just like how fast the blood is moving past or turbulent flow, meaning it's kind of not even flow. All these things can lead to damage potentially of the endothelium. And then what happens when that happens though, is we have physiologic changes. We'll have a decrease in that nitric oxide production. And like we talked about, when we have a decrease in our nitric oxide essentially the endothelium becomes more prothrombotic and then we, you know, decreases our TPA as well. And so we're much more likely to clot and lead to badness. Um, you know, the way I kind of think about that is it also when we have these chemicals go in and kind of lead to dysfunction in the endothelial cells, it just throws off the balance. We're also going to have, you know, some disruption of the tight junctions. So things might be able to get in, get out where they shouldn't be. You know, we might have activation of vasoconstrictors when we don't want that, or we're not as, you know, compliant. We can't squeeze down and out as much. So long story short, like lots of things happen when we don't, you know, when we have injured or damaged endothelium. And so just a 30,000 foot view back, normal endothelium, it keeps things out, right? It's nice and smooth. We don't have any clots. It has 
you know, properties and chemicals that inhibit it from clotting. When it gets damaged by things like smoking, hypertension, you know, high cholesterol, we can start damaging the endothelium. That can lead to decrease in nitric oxide, so decreasing of our anti-clotting properties. So we're gonna increase the clots, we're gonna increase the permeability as well. We're gonna break up some of those gap junctions. It's gonna be more likely that things can kind of get in and out where we don't want them. And so lots of bad things are happening, you know, and we do have endothelial dysfunction. That's why we care so much about it. Okay, and after the damage of the endothelium is started, we're gonna kind of roll through progression here. And as you can see, you know, we've got a little bit more on this slide than we did last time. So here there's a couple different things that are crossed out in different colors. And so, but after we damage the endothelium, essentially what happens is some adhesion molecules are gonna be expressed. And we don't want adhesion molecules, right? We do not want that. Usually what they do, you know, on the screen here, in this green is what we're looking for. Since this adhesion molecule is this little green part that attaches on, you know, into the endothelial cells and essentially attaches on to that um, intima layer there. And essentially what it's going to do is it's going to prevent white blood cells to come in like monocytes and lymphocytes to kind of bind, roll around, and we call transmigration, which kind of brings it, you know, across through the endothelium. And, you know, these molecules are called VCAM and ICAM, not super important, but I just wanted to include that as well. And these are so important because once these monocytes bind, so like monocytes being white blood cells, once they bind, they follow a chemical gradient called monocyte chemotractin protein one or MCP one. And essentially what happens is they've logged on to that receptor, right? They've locked onto it and they start to just sneak through into the sub endothelial space just behind the endothelium. So if you're watching on the video version, the sub endothelial space is just behind the endothelium here. So the endothelial like layer there usually protects things, keeping it out. Once you start getting stuff coming across through these junctions here you get into the sub endothelial space and that's right when we start to have problems. Once we're in the sub endothelial space, then essentially we can transform these white blood cells into macrophages, and this creates an inflammatory like reaction inside there, inside the arterial wall, which it doesn't sound good to have inflammation inside your artery wall, and if you guess that, that is correct. That is not a good thing. You know What happens then is these macrophages are white blood cells. They're normally good at like, scavenging throughout the body, right? We want them to scavenge foreign particles, but they do the same thing here in our sub endothelial space. So these scavenge lipids that like we talked about, they phagocytose things, you know, they find debris or various, you know, things around them, they gulp them up and they release a bunch of different cytokines. This like, once again, is just creating like a perfect storm. And normally in a perfect world, nitric oxide typically decreases the adhesion of platelets in the endothelium. But once again, when we have inhibition of that, that does not, ha does not happen. And they also typically inhibit migration of smooth muscle into the sub endothelial space. And then it inhibits, you know, all this deposition of things. But once we have damaged, you know, endothelial, we essentially have decreased nitric oxide and then de decreased nitric oxide leads to, you know, increased platelet binding and, you know, increased smooth muscle migration to sub endothelial space. So long story short, just stepping back from here, what's happening. The first thing when it's damaged is we have these receptor molecules, adhesion molecules kind of come there. They're a signal for white blood cells to come. Those white blood cells then come in, sneak on through into the sub endothelial their space and then they start just collecting lipids and all these things and creating all this inflammation and so this is the start of inflammation and the atherosclerotic pathway is essentially getting these white blood cells in there Another enzyme that plays a role is angiotensin II. If you've ever taken like a human physiology course before, it might sound familiar because this is something that has a, a lot of impact on hypertension and blood pressure control in our body. And essentially angiotensin II is made from angiotensin one via an ACE enzyme or angiotensin converting enzyme. And if you are familiar with pharmacology at all, ACEs are ACE inhibitors. And so and this is not just something that impacts blood pressure. It also impacts endothelial function and atherosclerosis. But when the endothelium is disrupted, it increases something called an AT1 receptor. And this is essentially a binding fight site for that angiotensin II. And then when we bind angiotensin II, this triggers a release of things called like NADPH and xanthine oxidase, which essentially increase oxidative stress and release free radicals and reactive oxygen species, which are even more toxic to the endothelium. So it's kind of, you know, a self-fulfilling like prophecy and cycle. It kind of, we start inflammation and it brings in more stuff and that creates more inflammation and our body just kind of gets in this cycle where it's just like oh, yeah, i'll just keep inflammation going all day all day and obviously we don't want that also on top of that angiotensin 2 also promotes smooth muscle proliferation and migration which once again leads to a loss of compliance so once again reduced elasticity is is not what we want a healthy artery is compliant and has you know elasticity and kind of like i said can go back and forth between squeezing and that and so a hardened artery is not a usually healthy artery but looking back stepping back 30,000 foot view for angiotensin 2 has much more to do than just blood pressure when it binds, angiotensin II can bind to the angiotensin you know, AT1 receptor. This leads to a bunch of different endothelial dysfunction. It can lead to releasing of more reaction oxygen species, free radicals, and just damage things more. And so it's kind of the theme is that like when we get this damage, our body's like trying to do its best to heal. It's like, oh yeah, I'll come help you. But then it just brings more things and like 
they're, you know, people are at a party, like, Hey, I'll come to the party. And then they bring a friend that you don't want. And that's essentially what happens. They just keep bringing all these things that we don't want. And we create this inflammation on top of inflammation. And it just kind of becomes, um, lots and lots of, of problems for our, our, our arteries. I did want to touch on the role of blood sugar here. Hyperglycemia and insulin resistance lead to formation of something called arterial advanced glycosylate end products. So that's like a big word. We abbreviate those as AGEs. And this actually can trigger, you guessed it, more inflammation. It also leads to lipoprotein glycosylation. So essentially adding sugar to lipoproteins and it makes the LDL particles more athrogenic and it also compromises HDL function. So adding sugar to our lipoproteins makes LDL worse and HDL worse as well. And so definitely things we don't want. Also elevated blood sugars can lead to decreased nitric oxide. And as we know, that's like the magical stuff that we want in the artery, but it does not do that. And it just really kind of leads to other inflammatory mediators and it leads to infiltration of white blood cells and overall just like leads to lots of big issues. It can also actually lead up with insulin resistance to dysfunctional fat around the coronary arteries, which then increases risk even more for atherosclerotic disease. And so um, when we talk so much about why we care about blood sugars, this is a small portion. It can happen everywhere, but this is a perfect example of what happens when we have too much sugar in there, right? If we have all the sugar, it attaches to these small arteries, right? And get all these changes. And this can happen like everywhere in the body. And that's why with bad blood sugars, we have problems with the kidneys and the eyes and, you know, and the heart we talked about. So these end, you know, these advanced glycosid end products, they're really a problem. And this is how they affect the atherosclerosis. And this is why it's so important that if we have, you know, blood sugar abnormalities, we're really trying to get a hold of that because that can be really, really helpful to control our risk for atherosclerosis. All right, let's talk about white blood cells, specifically monocytes and lymphocytes here. We've mentioned that white blood cells can bind and that's usually not that fantastic in atherosclerosis, but in normal physiology, we can have these things bind and then they can be exposed to things like macrophage colony stimulating factor and essentially a monocyte will then get turned into a macrophage. Normally that's totally fine. It's not a big deal. Usually it can leave the blood vessel, you know, by HDL or get taken up and, and can get out of there if it gets taken in. Normally that's not a problem. So if it does even get taken up to the sub into through the space, you know, if we have enough HDL or we're not overwhelmed, we can get it back out and it can leave. But in atherosclerosis, this doesn't happen. What happens is usually cholesterol can be transferred out of the cell by HDL, you know, with different scavenger receptors and ATB binding cassettes, and it's cleared from the area. So normally, like I said, we have some excess, okay, HDL come in, does its thing, picks it up and leaves. But when we're overwhelmed, this is when we start to get in trouble. You know, when we have lots and lots of LDL, when LDL is oxidized and it gets trapped, essentially this triggers scavenger receptors on the surface and the macrophages then take up these athrogenic lipoproteins. So essentially it's going around, they're doing their job. They're saying, okay, oof, that's in trouble. Let, let's take that up. Yep, let's eat that, let's eat that. So they take up lots of it. But what happens is they take up so many that eventually they, it gets overwhelmed and it starts to form something called a foam cell, which a foam cell then over time, you know, in the right inflammatory environment, like we've talked about here, if it starts you know, cycling over like that, the foam cell eventually becomes a fatty streak. And like I said, the fatty streak is kind of like the first layer. We're getting these kind of, like I said, macrophages eating all the lipids and the lipoproteins and creating this stuff. And it's just kind of doing their best, but essentially they can't get transported out fast enough. And so this is our body's way of saying, I don't want to do, uh, it's like essentially just, you know, shoveling stuff under your bed. It's like, okay, I know this isn't where it goes, but it's just going to go there. And theoretically, if you do that long enough, you'll just like your bed will start raising up. And that's kind of what happens in atherosclerosis as well. You know, after a fatty streak, you know, we do have a plaque that's finally there. So if we have, if you think about it with the bed analogy, you know, we're shoveling stuff underneath, that's our fatty streak. And eventually we lift it up to where we have like this actual bump underneath our bed. That's gonna be our Frank plaque. Um, there are also, like I said, RT lymphocytes that are involved in this as well. They follow different chemoattractants, bind to LDL, produce more inflammation and can be an issue as well. So like I said, but the big thing is here, this is like atherosclerosis. If you look at it here, white blood cells coming in, coming inside because of disrupted endothelium and finding LDL, VLDL, what have you, essentially atherogenic particles, eating them. And when we have so many of them and it can't keep up, that's essentially what leads to this atherosclerosis. Talking about another white blood cell here, we have neutrophils specifically. They can also get in the sub endothelial space. That seems to be a very common theme. Uh, I can do lots of different things. So they, they oxidize trapped lipoproteins. So it's never good to get something oxidized in the sub endothelial space. That's a common theme. They also relieve pro oxidative enzymes. So making things worse. Once again, they also release you know, different collagenases and other things that degrade the intracellular matrix. And essentially what this does is it weakens the plaque and you know, the fibrous cap of the plaque, which we'll talk about in a second here. But once again, weakening the plaque is not a good thing because usually the plaque is kind of, we're trying to just like wall it off saying, okay, like deal with it, just sit there. But if we start breaking that down, bad things can happen. Okay. And stepping back here, essentially what we're seeing is white blood cells. When they get into the sub endothelial space, it can be normal sometimes, but if we're in the setting of inflammation, it can lead to this atherosclerosis. So usually not a good thing. All right, let's talk about platelets now. So 
Platelets are crucial for clotting. You know, they work together with the coagulation cascade to kind of get full clotting, but they play a really big role in that. They also interact with the endothelial cells. Essentially what they do is they'll have, you know, they'll do binding, they'll cause inflammation and they adhere and cause clots. So essentially what they do is they interact with endothelial cells or leukocytes. They adhere to dysfunctional endothelial cells. So like I said, if we have that damage, platelets are like, oh, that looks like a place I can bind. And they'll do that. When they bind, once again, they turn down nitric oxide and that usually inhibits platelet aggregation. So once again, they're like, all right, come on in the water's fine. They turn that down, it brings in more platelets. This leads to this inflammatory response. Platelets could actually release inflammatory mediators as well. Um, and then this inflammation activates coactivation of platelets and neutrophils, which then leads to like monocyte adhesion, like we talked about the endothelial cells, and then recruitment inside. So platelets also play an important role because they only they create inflammation and they also bring along, you know, different white blood cells like we talked about. So pretty much nothing that I'm talking about here is like good. And so platelets are another example of creating clots in our, you know, small heart arteries, usually not a good thing. All right. And so like we've talked about here, a normal situation, you know, we get some of the white blood cells, we get the macrophages in, into their the sub endothelial space that can happen. You know, that can happen even without atherosclerosis and it starts taking up stuff and creates a foam cell. Normally these cells can undergo apoptosis and then are cleared and does not cause inflammation. However, like I said, when the rate of foam cell formation and accumulation increases, then the capacity for removal is exceeded. And essentially there's an accumulation of fat in the fatty streak builds. So like I said, normally we can get in there. We can get stuff in the sub and the space. That's not completely crazy, but the more stuff we have in there, the more likely we are to have problems. And that's why we care so much about it. If you don't have as many, you know, lipoproteins, you don't have as high of an LDL, there's less of a chance of stuff getting in there. So it's really just playing a numbers game. And so plaques though, you know, like I said, when we do have the foam cells that are in there and they can't undergo apoptosis because it's just too much to handle, we can't clear it, we can't clear it. This eventually becomes a plaque and this plaque has a lipid core and a fibrous cap. You know, early plaques typically aren't, aren't calcified. So some people say I got my coronary, coronary artery calcium score and I had nothing, you know, that doesn't necessarily tell us a whole ton because early plaques, you can still have a plaque, but there's no calcium. So we can't necessarily see it on a scan. But having said, when we are in this early stage and we don't have calcium and it's not fibrotic or necrotic in the core, this could potentially regress. So we could actually improve this potentially. But however, if it builds, it starts to build into the wall. So like kind of into towards the lumen and only late in the process though, does it completely obstruct the lumen. So if you think about it here, if you're looking at the video version, I'll explain it in words, you know, in that sub endothelial space, it will push into the lumen. So the lumen, meaning the opening in the hole of the blood vessel, it'll essentially push in there and it doesn't necessarily occlude off right away. That's a late stage disease and progression, um, but it can happen. But as it does continue to, you know, grow and progress, essentially what happens is we start to have necrosis of the lipid core, the fibrous cap, you know, more inflammation comes in and essentially this, what can happen is we can destabilize that plaque. And we'll talk more about that. Destabilizing our plaque is typically not a good thing and we can see why bad things happen. And next, we just wanna talk about what is a stable versus unstable plaque, like we just talked about here. An unstable plaque is usually a large lipid core. So just lots of lipids in there, lots of inflammation going on decrease smooth muscle density, all those things. Um, and a stable is the opposite of that essentially, right? So we have a small lipid core, we don't have inflammation and it's actually calcified. So if things are calcified, we're actually feeling pretty good that it's stable. There's actually some data that people who run like ultra marathons are more likely to have calcification in their arteries. The question is, is that pathologic? Is it not? That's not the discussion here. But that being said, when we see calcium in the arteries, you know, that does give us some sense that, okay, those actually have calcified over and are probably a little more stable. And so how does a plaque progress? Well, like I said, typically what happens is all this inflammation is going on. It kind of leads to these superficially erosion. So the top can kind of start to break down. We can have ulceration or, you know, maybe necrosis inside the, the core, lipid core. All this kind of breakdown can lead to an opening, right? So essentially exposes that lipid core to the blood, which, you know, if we have something exposed to the blood that shouldn't, that's not a good thing. It leads to usually more platelets and then making an overlying clot is what we try to do. Um, however, this happens though, we kind of have breakdown, then rebuild, breakdown, then rebuild. Eventually, like this can either build up enough where it completely obstructs the lumen. So we like have no blood flow there. Or what can happen is essentially we start to build things up and the cap gets flicked off and then that goes downstream and causes a heart attack or a stroke. And so that's why we care so much about it, like stabilizing plaques. When we talk about statins, they stabilize plaques. This is what we're talking about. So we are stabilizing the plaques that we don't have downstream effects. Like I said, if you're looking at a suspicious lesion, we just talked about it before, but usually, like I said, large plaque volumes are worse. The large necrotic core, you know, 
Um, those are things that how we kind of can predict you know, which ones are rupture, although that is not a very good game that we're good at is understanding which ones there. But once again, if we have lots of breakdown, lots of necrosis, we are having lots and lots of fatty deposits. Those are lesions that we don't feel that good about. And okay, just to close it up here, talking about the summary, atherosclerosis is very complicated, it has lots of genetic and environmental determinants, so it's not as simple as anything. You know, it encompasses all layers of the ulterior wall in terms of the endothelium, the intima, the media, the adventitia, all those things become abnormal and it get dis gets disrupted. And atherosclerosis is more than just LDL, like we talked about. It's not just LDL passively accumulating in the walls of the arteries, it involves oxidation, inflammation, and reorganization of the artery. And essentially, endothelial dysfunction is kind of like what triggers all this, right? It starts this whole cascade and be caused by things like dyslipidemia, hypertension, smoking, insulin resistance, a bunch of other things. And then once it's disrupted, right? So our endothelium is disrupted, nitric oxide production decreases, and there's a more prothrombotic environment. And so like that's gonna start triggering this thing. Then this triggers more inflammation and leads to oxidation and accumulation of ApoB containing particles inside the sub endothelial space. And this kind of starts to, you know, we give the white blood cells, they get involved, they eat it up, they start forming the foam cells and the fatty streaks and the plaques. And then eventually these plaques can evolve and extend and it builds a cap. And if that cap ruptures, that can be bad. That can lead to a heart attack and lead to a stroke or essentially it can remodel where it just causes the entire artery. You know, when people say, oh, I had 98%, 99% blockage. That's essentially what they're talking about. It's like all this buildup happened and they didn't necessarily have that top flick off yet and cause a heart attack, but they're really, really close. Um, and what we care though, is we care like medications like this, like statins, aspirin, blood thinners, anticholycemics, all can help these situations. Okay, and so I just wanna bring this home here. This is a very complicated process, right? There's lots of things going on. There's inflammation, there's LDL. But the main take home point I wanna say is like, we know that VLDL, LDL, all those ApoB containing particles, like those are a critical driver for atherosclerosis, right? If we don't have those, then we're not getting things in the sub endothelial space. And that's like essentially the fuel for the fire. Um, and so that's why we care so much about lowering those, right? It's such an important thing because if we don't have the substrate, to create this problem, then we're kind of cutting it off and preventing it before it happens. And so that's why I care so, so much about this, but I hope this is helpful for you. Um, we'll see you at the next lesson and we'll go from there. Hey, thanks so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. If you found this helpful, it would mean the world if you liked, commented, and subscribed, or shared with a friend. It would really help get the word out. So once again, thank you so much for joining. Now get off the computer, get outside, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.